Hi, it's Randy Rhodes. We missed you today, but out of the goodness of our heart, we'll play a little bit of what you missed. And for the entire show, whenever, wherever, go to randyrhodes.com and buy a stinking podcast. Right now, here's a clip from our show, and don't forget to catch our show live right here from 4 to 6 Eastern. Mary, how does it go? The fault. We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. From radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Knock, knock. Who's there? It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Rhodes Show. Turn up your mind. Hey, the internet. It's me, Trey, back on the porch. I know it's been a minute, but damn, I've just been busier than Donald Trump at a fuck shit up conference, so I apologize. But I wanted to come out here because a lot of people have asked me what I think about Black Lives Matter. Well, put simply, I think that they do. Goddamn. And further, I think that responding to that sentiment with all lives matter would be sort of like telling Susan G. Komen to chill it with all the pink shit on account of all cancer sucks. That last part's true, but it ain't really the fucking point. But a lot of other people have talked about those things a lot better than I can. I want to do what I do and address my people for a minute. Because, see, this has been framed largely as being Black Lives Matter versus the police. And from what I've seen, rednecks have pretty unanimously been against Black Lives Matter, which is pretty funny to me. Rednecks, help me out here. When did we start liking cops? Really? I must have missed the memo on that and boys. <laughs> yeah, for those of you who don't know, rednecks and the police are natural enemies and pretty much always have been. You ever seen the show, Cops? <laughs> About every other episode takes place in the damn trailer park. <laughs> and if that ain't enough for you, the single most popular redneck TV show of all time is literally just about two cousin fucking good old boys running from the law in a sweet-ass <laughs> orange car. You ever see Smokey and the Bandit? The hero ain't fucking smoky. It's sort of a whole thing with us. I've been surrounded by rednecks my whole life. I have never once seen them react positively to a sudden police presence. <laughs> Though, to be fair, it's sort of hard to stay positive when you think your midget mud wrestling tournament's about to get shut down. Dirty little titties, skew! See, that's the thing. <laughs> Cops do fuck rednecks. Always have, probably always will. But we're usually up to some pretty redneck shit. God damn, man, what's this country coming to? When a man can't even put a stick of dynamite inside a washing machine with Obama's face painted on the side of it without some <laughs> pussy calling the law. Okay. See, cops and rednecks have a strained relationship because cops typically stand in the way of our shenanigans. But imagine for a second that instead of busting us for trying to sell our food stamps for weed money, they were busting our heads open for resisting arrest. One of our favorite pastimes, by the way. <laughs> or they were murdering rednecks in front of kids because we had a gun in the truck which we always do. <laughs> what would we say then? What would the NRA say then? Because rednecks love guns, and if you ask them why, one of the most common answers would be because they need them in the event of oppression from a tyrannical government. <laughs> but when a group of people who deals with that kind of oppression on a day-to-day -day basis carries firearms and pays with their lives for it, we're nowhere to be found. Not advocating violence against police officers, the assholes who did that are deeply disturbed outliers who don't represent the movement. My point is, I would have hoped that rednecks of all people could have empathized with this whole thing. But we don't. And I wonder why. Just kidding. I don't <laughs> wonder. Nobody does. Because everybody knows the reason. And that's sort of the whole problem. I'll see y'all next time. Trey Crowder! Love him. Redneck liberal. You know, he's on tour. He's on tour. He's on tour. And if, uh, if you want to uh, buy tickets, I, he's coming to where I am. Uh, and I'm going. I'm definitely. He's going to. He'll be at the Improv uh, in Fort Lauderdale, and then he'll be in the Improv in West Palm Beach. So I get two, two, two nights of uh, Trey Crowder. It's the Well Red, R E D, <laughs> Well Red Comedy Cheer. And uh, you can buy tickets for that. But, I, you know, I, it, it's it's an amazing thing that we need we need more of him. We need more people accent st talking about, uh, you know, uh, the show Cops. <laughs> it's basically what it is. Because I love, I love that man. I love that man. He could beat me with a box of Tide inside the trailer park. And I won't press charges, Trey. I won't. I love that man. I will not. 
man, you want to press charge? No, that's Trey Crowder. He can beat me anytime with a box of Tide or a bottle of Downey. I loves him. So uh, anyway, yeah. Uh, why is Donald Trump going to Milwaukee? Why? Because he's the law and order candidate. And I guess he's going to extremely vet, <laughs> extremely vet the people of Milwaukee uh, to see if they belong there. I, I What is extreme vetting? I, I'm guessing he wants to torture people because uh, I think we extremely vet people already. I really do. I don't know why people are wondering where the money would come from to extremely vet people. We extremely vet them. There is no question about it. But why is he going to... You don't know how? Oh, well, it's very simple. Uh, if you're in a refugee camp, oh, let's say in Syria. Okay, let's say that. <laughs> you know, for argument's sake, let's pick a place. Syria, let's pick that. Uh, I told you, the, the United Nations has people that actually go to these refugee camps and they collect all the identifying documents from every single refugee. Every single one, especially ones that want to leave the refugee camp. Those people line up just like, um, oh, I don't know. How do I explain it for a Trump supporter? I was going to say for college registration, but they have never done that. So that would make no sense to them. Hmm. They line up like, oh, I know, for the food stamp check. <laughs> Is that a check? No, it's an EBT card. They won't understand what I'm saying either. Uh, they line up at the gun show, right? Okay. You line up at the gun show <laughs> to get a free cozy for your beer. The guns, of course, you know, that's another story, but they, uh, the UN is there. They're in the refugee camps. They collect all kinds of data, name, address, birthday, place of birth, bio data. What the hell's bio data? Um, well, they do, uh, the, the iris scan. They scan your little iris there and they feed that into a machine. And then, of course, all the information is checked again. And then only applicants who are a strong candidate for resettlement, which is less than 1%, move forward in the process. They move forward in the process to step number two. <laughs> oh, yeah, this can go on all day because it's a long two-year process. People are so ignorant in this country. It's just an amazing thing. Uh, they, they think Donald Trump said something new yesterday or Donald Trump said something that we don't do needs to be. You know, I, I, I don't understand why people go, yeah, that needs to be. done. And then if I tell you Obama does it, we shouldn't be doing that. Why the hell are you busting the chops of Syrians? Because <laughs> Obama does it. But if Trump says we need to do it to the Syrians, they're like, yeah, let's do this here and let's waterboard him too. And let's torture him. You know. But then that you move on to step number two, which is to collect all uh, all your applicant. You fill out a file. You've, there's a million questions. You have to fill out your applicant file, and then uh, they do the security check based on the biometrics, based on the data, the fingerprints, the iris scans, all that. Okay, and if you <clears throat> and if you are still considered okay, <laughs> then you move on to step number three, which is the biographic security check. That start seriously. That start doesn't that sound painful? It, I mean, if that doesn't you know move the rednecks that Obama is your president, that he's doing uh, extreme biographic uh, security checks. I mean, come on. Why, why don't they leave them Syrians alone? Yeah, no. First, uh, it goes to um, the enhanced intra-agency security. <clears throat> okay, these refugees are subject to the highest level of security checks of any category of travel to the United States, by the way. Okay, so the U.S. security agency screened the candidate, including these are the agencies that screen the candidate. Why do you think that we don't do that? I don't. Oh, my God. The National Counterism Terror. Uh, counterism Terror. Uh, I can't even say it it's so long. The National Counterterrorism Center Intelligence Community Agency. <laughs> That's a lot of words, darling. Don't be scared now. I'm going to keep going. Then it goes to the FBI. All these bio, biographic security checks go to the FBI after that. Then they go to the Department of Homeland Security. And then they go to the State Department. And what are they looking for? What are they looking for? Information that this individual is on any of our lists that they pose any security risk that they have any connection at all to any bad actors on our security list or they have any outstanding warrants immigration or criminal violations D the department of homeland security conducts an enhanced review of the syrian cases which 
are referred to the UCCIS Fraud Detection and National Security Directorate for review, research that is then used by the interviewing officer, yes, there's an in-person interview with the officer, informs lines of question related to the applicant's eligibility, el- eligibility. <laughs> I've been listening to Trey Crowder all morning, <laughs> and credibility, okay? This process is repeated, repeated, it's like you go back to, you know, go back to uh, jail, you do not pass, go, do not collect 200, you go right back to the beginning of the line. If any new information is provided, like you used a previously different name, forget it, I'd, I'd keep on going to the back of the line. I have had so many names, it's unbelievable, including the C word, but only on my YouTube page. <laughs> and so uh, if your phone number has changed, okay, you then go back to the beginning of the National Counterterrorism Center Intelligence Community FBI Department of Homeland Security State Department screening. You go back to the beginning. Okay, and it's repeated any time there's any new information. Okay, let's say you pass. You're, you're part of the 1% that made it this far and nothing's changed and you're good to go and blah, blah. Okay, so now you move on to step number four. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Step number four. The Department of Homeland Security, DHS, UCCIS interview. Interviews are conducted by UCCIS officers specially trained for interviews. Fingerprints are collected and submitted, and they are cross-referenced with the previous biometric checks. (laughs) Now, if your fingerprint results or any new information raises any questions... Go back to process number two and start all over again. If new biographic information is identified by UCCIS at an interview, additional security checks on the information are conducted and UCCIS places a case on hold and does additional research or investigation. Otherwise, you move to step number five. (laughs) I'm not kidding. Step number five, the applicant's fingerprints are taken by U.S. government employees and they are screened against the FBI's prior biometric data. Biometric data that the FBI has has cross-referenced to the biometric data collected in the refugee camp. (laughs) Yeah, that's how many times they're going to do it. Okay, fingerprints are screened against the DHS biometric database, which is also cross-referenced to the refugee camp uh, biometric data. And the DHS uh, uh, databases contain the watch list information and previous immigration encounters that you've ever had in the U.S. or any place overseas. So if you, let's say, are in, oh, the pressure of a place, Syria, and you tried to get into Turkey, we would know that. So for all the people go, well, Syria, it's falling apart and Assad doesn't keep good records. Don't you love that? Assad doesn't keep good records. <laughs> the Syrian government doesn't keep good records. So we have no way to check. We have no way to see where they lived. We have no way to know that they were really in the refugee camp. We have no way to know that they are really fleeing hostile intentions against their life. We have no way of knowing that they're really persecuted or, or, or that they're uh, be, being uh, hunted by it. We have no way of knowing. <laughs> of course we do. Uh, And then, of course, uh, the fingerprints are screened against the U.S. Department of Defense biometric database, which also includes fingerprint records that are captured in Syria or Iraq or any other country uh, that you wish to, uh, you know, immigrate from. Now, if you haven't already been stopped, this would be the end point for cases with security concerns, meaning you're rejected at this point. If, if, If you hadn't been stopped already... By steps one, two, three, four, or five, you would be, at this point, if there's any security concern for our government about you, that's it. It's the the process for entry is done. You cannot come in. Otherwise, move on to step six. (laughs) Step six. Medical screening. (laughs) Oh, yes. If you are denied due to medical reasons, that's it, you're out. If you're okay, if if there's no medical treatment necessary, if you don't have any communicable diseases such as TB or Zika, 
Then you move on to step seven. If you do have any medical uh, problems, that's it, you're out. Step seven, cultural orientation. I believe this is uh, what Donald Trump was referring to when um, he said he wants extreme, extreme questions. I don't know. Uh, But assessment is made by a U.S.-based non-governmental organization to determine the best resettlement location for the candidates. Candidates uh, considerations include the health of the candidate. So let's say you got asthma like Henry Hill and he doesn't want to go any place cold, just no place cold. You may get resettled in Scottsdale. <laughs> if you have family in the United States, if, if a candidate has family already living here in a certain area, they may be placed in that area to be near their family. And then, of course, if there is doubt whether an applicant poses a security risk, they will not be admitted. And throughout this process, pending applications continue to be checked against terrorist databases, uh, relevant terrorism information that hadn't come to light during this two-year process, and it is a two-year process. And if a match is found, then it is the, the review of the case is paused. If you make it through that, you go to step eight. Step eight, U.S. arrival. All refugees are required to apply for a green card within a year of their arrival to the United States, which triggers another set of security procedures within the U.S. government. If you are denied, back you go. (laughs) But if you make it through this two-year process and you've gone through steps one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, welcome to the United States. It's just those 10 easy steps. Wow. (laughs) Yep, it's just those 10 easy steps. So uh, you say, uh, if you make it through step 10, we say, Refugees are woven into the rich fabric of American society, and we welcome you. (laughs) Hope you didn't take offense to the probing and the scanning and the fingerprinting and the cultural questioning and the, uh, you know, anal probes and the scans of your iris and, uh, you know, uh, uh, the the, the, uh, traveling to your house in Syria to make sure it was devastated and half your family's dead. Yeah, I'm sorry. Excuse us, please. Just excuse us. But this is this is what Moron Boy was was saying that he wants done. You know, and, and I must say, candidate the other candidate, okay, needs to actually bring this list with her. She needs to tweet this. This is an infographic. I tweeted it last night so you could take a gander at it, make sure that I got it right. Uh, go to my, go to Randy uh, at Randy Radio. That is my Twitter. Uh, there is an infographic there. Uh, the Randy Road Show Facebook. There's an infographic there. It's all there, and it comes directly from WhiteHouse.gov, and uh, it is a multi intra inter agency, you know, big hullabaloo thing. You got to jump through hoops and have probes and prints and scans and health checks and oh my god and and, and uh, yeah okay. And so let's just remember. A good chunk of the uh, people who have done bad things in our country. Let's just remember um, a good chunk of those were American citizens. Let's just remember that. All right. Thank you. (laughs) Just a note from management here. Thank you. Otherwise, welcome to America. (laughs) You are part of the rich fabric of our society. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know why, but he's going to Milwaukee today. To confab with the police. The police. The police in Milwaukee. <clears throat> you know, we're going to talk about this. The sheriff of Milwaukee, I think if you fired him right away, this guy Richard Clark, this self loathing black man, he really does hate himself. It is a really weird thing. He's got it completely ass backwards and he's in charge of uh, policing Milwaukee. I think that's uh, probably a good chunk of your problem, too. He's a bizarre individual, and um, I can only hope that Donald Trump went there to fire him. You're fired. That would be cool, but I doubt it. (laughs) I doubt it. Clear for takeoff. Randy Rhodes, Air Force.
Force. RandyRhodes.com. Hi, it's Randy Rhodes. We missed you today for the entire show. Whenever, wherever, go to RandyRhodes.com and buy a stinking podcast. And don't forget to catch our show live right here from 4 to 6 Eastern.